Well, greetings all. Uh, I'm Stuart Schwab, and I'm delighted to be moderating, uh, really on behalf of uh, Gerald Torres, who organizes uh, these things, who's stuck in a snowstorm somewhere, but uh, in relatively sunny Ithaca, that's not our problem. Uh, and and it's, an, it's an honor uh, and, and, and uh, privilege for me to be here to moderate uh, as we celebrate Sid Tarot's uh, latest, latest book done here. And while he needs no introduction, I'm going to give one anyway. Uh, Sid Tarot uh, is the Emeritus Maxwell M. Upson Professor of Government uh, here at Cornell University, but uh, we're delighted to say uh, since becoming Emeritus, he has come down to the law school and uh, is now a visiting professor at Cornell Law School since two, officially since 2014. Uh, Sid got his bachelor's degree from Syracuse, his master's degree from Columbia, where he studied with Alan Weston, and his PhD from Berkeley. Uh, his first book in 1967, Peasant Communism in Southern Italy, he followed that up with others uh, still uh, focusing on Italy in the 1980s, the reconstruction of the Italian protest cycle in democracy and disorder. More recent books, Power and Movement, which has now three editions, uh, Strangers at the Gates from Cambridge in 2012, The Language of Contention in 2013, and War, States, and Contention, the one we are uh, celebrating from uh, Cornell Press uh, last year. A fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, Sid has served as program co-chair of the American Political Science Association Annual Convention and as president of its section on comparative politics. A really distinguished figure. We're delighted to have him generally at the law school and specifically here today. Now, to celebrate this uh, is not me, but three of our faculty members here at the law school. Uh, Mike Dorf uh, is going to speak uh, first, and I'm told the speakers will go, ah, you know, 15 minutes, uh, sure. uh, followed by Joe Margulis here at the law school, who we also share with the uh, government department. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, Yenzo Lean. That will then give time for Sid to come and synthesize and say his remarks, and then we'll follow by general discussion. I should say that there are a few books uh, available here, and so those of you who uh, uh, would, would like one, um, feel free to come down uh, afterwards uh, and contact that. Okay, so uh, Mike, please start. Thank you, Stuart. Let me begin by saying uh, how delighted I am that uh, Sid has chosen to spend so much of his time these last few years here at the law school. Uh, I had the privilege to co-teach a uh, seminar with him a few years ago on the Constitution and Society uh, in which I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, we were, uh, uh, as a result of some issues that arose in that seminar, we co-authored a paper together, uh, and I'm now lucky enough that his office is right across the hallway from mine. Uh, so for me, it's been a tremendous uh, educational experience uh, to see uh, Sid's mind at work uh, and to draw on his uh, wealth of knowledge. Um, I uh, previewed my remarks today in a uh, column. I write a biweekly column for a web magazine called Verdict. And uh, as does Joe. Um, and uh, so I uh, took the opportunity to uh, write down a few thoughts in the nominal form of a book review, uh, which I titled uh, What War is Good For? Um, and then this being the age of social media, I promoted it um, uh, via Twitter and Facebook, whereupon a former colleague of mine who was a uh, Cornell uh, undergraduate in the 1970s uh, commented uh, on the, the page that uh, he took Sid's class in uh, French and Italian politics in 1977 
and it was a fantastic experience. He's delighted to see that Sid is still going strong. Uh, I suspect there are many people out there uh, whose first introduction to the complex relation between law, social movements, uh, and what uh, the broader phenomenon of uh, political contestation uh, was through Sid. Um, Okay, let me say a few words about what this book uh, does, uh, and then I'll add uh, a thought or two of my own about uh, what the upshot is. So, uh, the book, by the way, which is, is wonderfully interesting, uh, has a core thesis uh, and lots of rich case studies. Uh, here's the, the core thesis, but to, to understand it, you have to situate it uh, between two opposing theses that Sid associates one with Harold Laswell and others that, will, that he calls the, sort of the garrison state, that's Laswell's term, uh, and the other with Charles Tilly. So the, and the question, the fundamental question uh, that uh, is at issue in war states and contention is what is the relation among war, state building, and rights? And for Laswell, the answer is a rather dark relation. Uh, and it's a very familiar notion from uh, our general uh, terms of public debate. The idea is that war means the constriction of rights. Uh, you can see this view in um, uh, American politics, in uh, 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 former Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote a book uh, late in his career um, in which he talked about how during wartime the political branches tend to constrict uh, social and political rights and the courts tend to go along with it. There's a robust literature in the legal academy that takes for granted the proposition that war restricts rights. And then the question it addresses is whether once the war is over, rights sort of make a comeback. Uh, so you can see some of this, especially in Jeffrey Stone's work, uh, but also uh, both uh, Posner Pear and Posner Fees have written a bit about this uh, as well. Uh, but the basic idea, the basic framing is uh, war constricts rights. As against that view, uh, Sid contrasts the view uh, associated with Charles Tilley, uh, his sometime uh, collaborator, uh, who says that war creates states and that states also then create rights. Uh, and this notion works most clearly in what we might call the modern era, beginning roughly uh, in the 18th century, but having roots a little bit earlier. Right? So the idea here is that uh, when nations go to war, their leaders can't simply coerce the population into going along with the war effort. That War requires the cooperation of the population, the mobilization of the population, what become, comes to be known as the citizen army. And so to mobilize the citizen army, uh, the state needs to give something in return. Uh, and that something is rights. And so it's not accidental that the French Revolution and the American Revolution are associated with expansion of notions of citizenship, that in more modern times we see coming out of uh, World War II, right, the, first the desegregation of the military uh, just at the end, right, in, early in the Korean War, uh, you see the adoption of the, um, the, the, the lowering of the voting age, right, of voting rights in response to the anti-Vietnam War protests. 
And the general phenomenon is uh, that war brings out rights. But then there's the puzzle, of course, which is that sometimes it doesn't. And so the missing element, and this is, I think is the core thesis of the book, the missing element as to, that tells us when does war lead to the constriction of rights and when does it lead to the expansion of rights and which rights is uh, politics. Um, in particular, what uh, Sid calls contentious politics. Now, contentious politics is sometimes uh, translated to mean social movements or social and political movements, but it means something broader than that. It's social movements, it's political movements, but it's also other venues in which there is political contestation. It can be labor strikes. Um, it can be uh, people in the streets. Um, the, but the basic idea is that uh, it could even be a civil war. Right? But the idea is that, that there is action on the home front. Uh, people making claims against the government for rights, for changes in policy, and so forth. Uh, and it's, so it's this interaction between the state and its war-making aims and the contentious politics that determines whether we get rights or not. And so Sid has some examples in rich detail about cases in which you might think that the state's need for a citizen army would lead to the expansion of rights, but in fact you get a rollback. Uh, you get a rollback, you get the assertion of the garrison state, and it's mediated through contentious politics. Uh, now Sid is, if nothing uh, else, he is extremely careful. And so he avoids overclaiming. Uh, and therefore, the conclusion of the book is that contentious politics is a kind of X factor. Right? You don't know which way it's going to go. Will you see politics uh, in an anti-war movement to expand the base? Or will you see a broad-based populist xenophobic reaction to war and national security threats? That gets played out in contentious politics, but it's not determined in advance. And so the book is not so much a, uh, a formula that tells you this kind of war inevitably leads to this contraction or expansion of rights so much as it is a rich account of the ways in which things can go right and the ways in which things can go wrong. Now let me say a word or two uh, about my own take uh, on, on the book and where, where we're left. Um, it seems to me that uh, I want to I take a somewhat dark view. Right? That is, I want to say that although the world of Tilly is still possible, we are increasingly likely to find ourselves in the Lasswell world. Uh, and I'm going to uh, point to two basic reasons. One is the increased uh, technologization, if that's a word, of warfare. Right? That is to say, um, warfare was never, right, it was never the case that the uh, side with more foot soldiers inevitably won the battle. But other things being equal, uh, that's the way you bet, right? That's why, although the South had better generals, the North won the Civil War because it had more manpower and a greater industrial base, right? But as warfare becomes more and more high tech, the number of troops needed to secure victory is often uh, not so many. And so what you see is a gradual disconnection between the capacity to, wake, to make war and the need to rely on mass mobilization. All right, so just contrast the war of the last decade and a half right, with the Vietnam War. Right? So the United States has been more or less continuously at war since 9-11, right? That's uh, about uh, 14 and a half years, right? Um, there were initially 
large protests in the streets uh, over the Iraq War. Um, there has been there has been sort of on and off some con some ongoing protests, uh, but for the most part, the war has not generated a popular anti-war movement in part because it affects so few people directly. Right? The war is carried out with a smaller force. Uh, that's partly because of the technology, but it's also for strategic and tactical reasons. This is the second factor, right? which is uh, as the major security threats facing um, large states shift from other large states to non-state actors, uh, the use of large-scale occupying forces uh, becomes counterproductive. Now, this was a big debate, you may recall, early in the uh, Iraq War when many of the critics of uh, Bush and Rumsfeld argued that they weren't sending enough troops over to Iraq, uh, and that might well have been true. It might well have been true that a, a larger footprint was necessary to uh, pacify the country, but there's plenty of evidence that a large footprint would also, could also be counterproductive, right? It, it lends credence to the claims of the uh, insurgents that the U.S. or the other invading country uh, intends to occupy and is engaged in a neo-imperialist project. Uh, and therefore, that's also pushing back against the use of large numbers of troops. And so it seems to me that in the modern era, uh, and by the modern, I mean, I mean the very modern era, the movement is against the great citizen armies of that you might think of as uh, that we associate with the sort of the French Revolutionary period. All right. Uh, meanwhile, in the developing world, um, absent a deep commitment to democracy already, it seems to me that uh, warfare is not likely to produce rights either because you have powers that uh, are able to marshal their war effort through uh, what Sid calls hierarchical power, right? So uh, yes, even uh, dictators like uh, you know Bashar al-Assad or Kim Jong-un depend in some way on some measure of popular support but it's not the kind of dependence that is likely to lead them to uh, expanding rights. And so I end up, after reading this book, somewhat pessimistic. I end up thinking that, yes, Tilly uh, had, had a point, and it is at least in principle still possible that contentious politics can turn war into a generator of the expansion of rights, but on the whole, that's not the way things are likely to go. That on the whole, we're more likely to see wars pushing in the last well direction of the garrison state. Uh, in any event, that's uh, my pessimistic take for the day. Uh, now I'll turn to Joe to make America great again. Right. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what a bright, sunny uh, guy I am, uh, so you can count on me to be cheery uh, about all of this. Um, I, I'm very uh, flattered to be here, uh, and before I get it underway with my remarks, I just want to say one thing. I know with an absolute certainty that I would not be on the faculty of Cornell University right now were it not for uh, my friend Sid Taro and uh, my friend Mary Katzenstein. It's absolutely true. I would not be here today, and I'd like to recognize both of them. Um, <clears throat> there is a conventional wisdom about the relationship between war and rights. The conventional wisdom is the one that Mike described as articulated by the former Chief Justice uh, and uh, Jeff Stone. It is the idea that when the uh, bombs start exploding and the guns go off, rights restrict, rights contract. Maybe they come back when the, when the uh, guns go silent again, uh, but this is what we always do. And Jeff Stone wrote a book that was very popular and, and, and very successful that was published right after 9-11, shortly after 9-11, uh, called Perilous Times, 
where he did what th this became a, the, the, the mantra. You know, so here's the time that we did this uh, in um, uh, the, the 18th century, and here's the time we did this during the Civil War, and here's the time we did this just around the, the period of the First World War, and here's what we did uh, during the Second World War, and here's what we did during McCarthy, and look, this is what's going to happen if we're not careful, we're going to do it again. That's the conventional wisdom. And immediately after 9-11, it became the dominant narrative uh, journalistically. This, this, this uh, uh, prediction that if we weren't careful, we would uh, uh, restrict rights in a way that we would come to regret. Uh, I want to suggest to you that it is obvious that this is an unsatisfactory framing. And Sid's contribution to this uh, is critical in two respects. Though it is the dominant framing, it is incomplete in multiple respects. And one of the ways that Sid's advance, Sid advances the ball is the way that Mike describes. I want to suggest in the course of my remarks that there is a different way that is theoretically uh, even more promising, theoretically even more rich. This framing has to be unsatisfactory if you think about it uh, in this way. There's no question that what you identify in the uh, restriction is a recurring sociological phenomenon. The fact is it happens the way Jeff Stone describes, yes. In that respect, however, it is simply a recurring phenomenon of a, a, like a lot of sociological episodes, right? So it's like the recurring phenomenon of a moral panic or market bubbles. The fact is we know they happen because of predictable sociological or psychological forces. But to observe that, it, it begins the conversation rather than ends it. Because the phenomenon, when it recurs, is itself embedded within realities uh, of the circumstances of the time. So what do I mean by that? The event takes place within a given structural reality. What is structural reality? Well, I would say it's given to us by economic conditions, resource constraints, population constraints, demographic constraints, uh, technological constraints of the sort that Mike described, perhaps legal constraints. Legal constraints can opt or operate as uh, 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 some structural limitations. So there is a structural reality in which the sociological phenomenon takes place that shapes it, constrains it, bounds it. But there is another that I would say is even more important, and I'm glad that my friend uh, Mitch Lasser is here because he can set me straight when I misstate what this is about. There is an ideological reality that it is embedded within. That is to say, the episode unfolds, the sociological uh, event unfolds within a context of a belief system, a dominant belief system that gives us the allowable uh, prejudices and biases and what Gramsci calls the, the common sense of the society that also shapes and constrains what you, can, what you are allowed to call possible uh, as this sociological phenomenon is unfolding. And the difficulty is, so the sociological phenomenon takes place within this structural and ideological firmament. The difficulty, the complexity is, that firmament is itself dynamic, it's changing. As, as Josh Chaffetz has reminded me, they are recursive, the structural reality affects the ideology. The ideology affects the structural reality. Uh, the the uh, phenomenon itself has an influence on it. As it trends through time, it shapes. We know that ideological uh, attachments change. So what you have is a stable or recurring sociological phenomenon, an impulse, which is embedded within a dynamic, undulating, uh, uh, so, um, uh, structural and ideological moment that is changing constantly, influencing itself, changing over time. How do you model that? How do you, how, of course it is true that the phenomenon recurs, but that begins the conversation and is theoretically parched and inadequate 
uh, to try to really understand it unless you grapple with the changes that are take pla taking place as it unfolds constantly. That's the real moment. It is, a, it, is a, it is a phenomenon of, it seems to me, almost unimaginable complexity that I have not been able to try to describe, to model in more detail. That's the point which you all call, that's where Sid makes his intervention. One piece of that is the idea of political contestation. And that's what Mike describes. Sid offers political contestation as the Rosetta Stone that helps us explain whether rights will contract or, or expand. I would suggest, it's extremely important insight. It's an extremely important insight. I would suggest, however, and at first when Sid was developing the book, I thought that was the great brilliance of it. I now think that it's the first step. And since I learned from listening to Valerie Hans' the, sort of the, 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 the talk about Valerie Hans' new book, that what we're really supposed to do here is describe Sid's next book, uh, that's what I want to try to, to get him focused on. Yes, there's no question that political contestation has, this, has some predictive value in giving us some indication of whether the rights will expand or contract. But I want to suggest to you that political, and I want to suggest to Sid, that political contestation uh, is still wrapped within the same uh, elements that he's trying to explain. In other words, as, as, uh, as Mike suggests, the political contestation takes place within an ideological framework and a structural framework. So it can't be invoked to explain these phenomena because it is itself a, affected by and an aspect of this phenomena. What you need to do is to find something that transcends it, that is an axis that runs through it, that can be measured through time as the firmament changes, the structural and ideological firmament changes, and the sociological phenomenon unfolds. And at the end of his book, or at the end of his research as he was writing this book, he latched on something that I think could play this role. And this is what I think has the great, holds out great promise. He latched on the work of Michael Mann. And Michael Mann is a, an historical sociolo sociologist, and he's a sociologist who takes an historical approach to sociological phenomena. And Mann wrote on the nature of power as a constant that can be examined independent of changing structural and ideological conditions. And Mann hypothesized uh, the difference between infrastructural power and hierarchical power and Sid calls hierarchical power despotic power. And hierarchical power is the idea that the state will simply impose itself on the citizenry and on the, on the structure of, of life in, this, in society. And that's one form of power that manifests itself. But another, and that's typically, in, you'll see that in, obviously in more totalitarian states, but another is the idea of infrastructural power where the state begins to penetrate society and exerts itself in a um, much more subtle, nuanced, complicit, uh, participatory way. So I think of it this way, as a, at the risk of gross oversimplification. Obviously the state can achieve its ends by beating people with a club. But it is much more successful at achieving its ends. If it can get people to beat itself, beat themselves with a club, beat themselves with a the club, right? And even better, to call it just. To call it, ah, what you are doing is natural. What you are doing is normal. What you are doing is what you ought to do. The former is uh, despotic power. The latter is infrastructural power. What Sid observes is that in the post, certainly in the post-World War II period, and even accelerated in the post, um, in, the, in the arrival of the national security state, is the relative decline of um, hierarchical power, of despotic power, and the relative increase in infrastructural power. 
so that the state penetrates civil society and pe penetrates the market to get it to do its bidding uh, in a way that is hidden, in a way that is concealed behind the veil of ideology and is otherwise uh, concealed from us. If the, but, but it's under theorized in this book. It's not developed fully in this book. It is, it's, it's just, we, we just get a glimpse at the possibilities that this represents. I think that this, which can lay bare the difference, first of all, get us focused away from the idea that the only way rights constrict is through the blunt use of hierarchical power, despotic power. Get us away from that and get us to thinking that it can happen, that rights can be restricted through this more infrastructural penetration and to measure it and to, and to assess it in a more nuanced way has great potential to add to the theoretical richness of this old question. And the last thing I would add, the last thing I would mention is that the, one, of the, one of the things that makes it so rich is the example that comes from, well, it's the, it's the Snowden example that, that, that Sid invokes. So Snowden is an example of uh, infrastructural power. Snowden's role is infrastructural. That is, he was penetrated into, he was participatory in civil society. He was a contractor who worked for the Rand Corporation who was dispatched to uh, and connected with uh, the NSA. So it shows how the NSA is sort of penetrating civil society. But the Snowden affair, that is the fact that he uh, uh, took all these documents and um, later leaked them to uh, um, uh, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald and um, Julian Assange and Laura Poitras, shows that infrastructural power can be deep in its penetration but is always incoherent because the capacity to control the state and its actors um, when you're operating infrastructurally will always be incomplete. So there is this dynamic of gradually deeper penetration but less coherent penetration. That's where we are heading. That's the trend to which we are going. Uh, and if Sid can develop that as his next book, I think we will have a real theoretical breakthrough on the genuine relation, at least in a Western state, uh, between war and rights. And I look forward to that book. Thank you. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to come here to talk about Sid's new book. Um, this is this is truly a great book. It um, is a book that tackles very big themes and tackles them with very big ideas, which I think is the role and responsibility of great scholars to engage with the most difficult questions. And Sid has been doing that his entire career, and this book is no exception. So it was a pleasure to read, um, and it's a pleasure to grapple with some of the complex ideas that are presented in it. Um, I think one of the things I like most about Sid's writing in the book is that he's operating on such multiple levels. He's um, dealing with very abstract concepts and abstract frameworks, so he's at you know, 10,000 feet, but then when he discusses examples and discusses particular time periods, he comes all the way down uh, to an elevation of, of 100 or, or, or 10 feet. He's right on the ground. And, He's able to seamlessly move back and forth between these different elevations, oftentimes in a single paragraph, in a way that I found very illuminating. And that's what I look for when I pick up a piece of scholarship, is to see that kind of flexibility in operating on those multiple domains, because I think that's also, um, speaking for myself, how I like to think as well. Um, and Sid does that incredibly beautifully. Um, in light of that, sort of dual aspect that he has to his work, talking about particulars and talking about generalities, I wanted to just briefly talk about two different ideas, one of which I think is a very abstract concept that he deploys, and then the other is the specifics of his account, in particular relating to uh, the last 10 years on the, the war on terror, which is a subject that I think uh, and write about a lot. 
Um, so the first having to do with an abstract concept, as you've heard from uh, both uh, Mike and Joe, uh, Sid is probably um, one of the country's great commentators on this notion of contentious politics. And in this book, he applies his concept of contentious politics to um, the particular subject matter that he's, he's tackling here. But I have to confess um, that when I first started reading Sid's work, I wasn't entirely clear on what contentious politics were. And although I'm mostly clear on what contentious politics is, I'm not entirely clear on it. Um, and at first, when I was confused about contentious politics, I was somewhat anxious and embarrassed by my confusion because I thought it was a symptom of my outsider status as someone who right, was trained in law and in philosophy but had no formal training in political science. And so I thought maybe if I was just an insider, I would um, be more comfortable with the term contentious politics. But over the last um, you know, year, uh, maybe 18 months, I've spent a lot more time with political scientists. I've gone to several conferences where Papers by political scientists have been workshopped, and I've gotten a sense for how they engage in their, you know, their scholarly disputes. And I was surprised that um, during these workshop presentations, they would spend the entire time um, questioning each other and disputing the terms that they were using in their analytical frameworks and fighting about the definitions of those particular terms. So now I don't feel so anxious about um, <laughs> my uh, sort of anxiety over what contentious politics are. And you know, my, my anxiety here is, or the reason why I don't fully understand what contentious politics are, uh, is that it really, I have the difficulty seeing the dividing line between politics simpliciter and contentious politics. Um, now, of course, this is not a new point. It's one that Sid has encountered before. And uh, in his book, he even says, when he first lays out the term contentious politics, which of course he's already written several books about, so he's, he's not uh, to be faulted for um, uh, not giving a full-blown defense of the term in, in, in this work, since he's done it in, in at least two books before. Um, but he does briefly discuss the issue, and he says, quote, it might be objected that all forms of politics include contention, but this is actually untrue. Processes such as financial exchange, licensing, celebrating, and passing routine legislative enactments are part of politics but are not normally contentious. Congressional debates and elections are contentious, all right, but they are not non-routine. Um, I understand what Sid is getting at when he, when he says that, but I think that there's a difference in those examples. I wouldn't necessarily describe those particular examples as non-contentious, I would describe them more as boring. Um, there are various right, pieces of legislation that are passed by Congress. There are various dis disputes that you might say, well, there's someone who cares about that, but that someone is not me um, because it has no general application to me. But um, there are various interest groups who are fighting over this particular uh, political outcome. And by this very definition, right? I mean, uh, you know, the, the affairs of the polis will by definition involve contention because uh, if the matter is of universal agreement, it's not one that requires resolution in the political sphere. So it seems to me that politics by its very definition is contentious. Um, and uh, you know, if, if that is the you know, sort of dividing line between contentious politics and politics is a little bit unclear, um, I would love if, um, you know, not necessarily uh, in this book or even in the next book, but maybe in the context of our conversation here, uh, Sid could say a little bit more about um, contentious politics and the dividing line between social movements on one hand as a particular exemplar of contentious politics and then politics in general. And I think one of the reasons why I was motivated to, to, to mention this point this evening was, uh, you know, watching the election returns and the uh, process playing out in, uh, in Iowa and New Hampshire, right? And if that's not contentious, I don't know what is. Um, uh, I mean, and, it, and it's not, and I'm not saying that in a, in a kind of silly way, but I was, you know, thinking of just one example of an incredibly routine interaction where uh, Rubio uh, came into a diner in New Hampshire. I think it was Rubio, or maybe it was Ted Cruz, but I think it was Rubio. Um, and he came, <laughs> um, he, came, he came across, well, he, was, he, uh, he went into the diner in, in New Hampshire, and he immediately started talking with the uh, 
uh, clientele who had not been pre-selected for this engagement. He just walked in to do retail politicking. And the man immediately started berating him, saying, uh, you know, why do you deny my access to the political and social system and claim that I shouldn't be treated equally just like everyone else? And his point was, this was a gay man who had um, uh, married his gay partner in part because New Hampshire has legalized gay marriage, but also now because of the Supreme Court process. And Rubio doesn't agree with that and thinks that um, marriage is, is between a man and a woman, and it was an incredibly, uh, you know, sharp interaction, um, and that strikes me as being the bread and butter of the political system and very, very contentious. So I, I want to hear a little bit more about the, about the nature of contentious politics. Okay. So uh, I now want to shift gears a little bit and talk about more concrete stuff. In particular, um, one of the major sort of application chapters, or really two chapters, in Sid's book where he talks about the war on terror and everything that happened in the United States with regard to both our foreign and domestic policy since 9-11. Um, as I said before, this is something that's animated my own thinking for many years. And one of the things that struck me as sort of missing, and I think it, not missing because Sid left it out, but because I suspect, though I'm not sure, that he doesn't think it's there, is any crucial difference or um, uh, shift in the United States in 2008 when Obama was elected, right? So the story that I read in Sid's book is a story that, at least in terms of the war on terror, starts uh, with 9-11 and continues up until this, uh, until this very moment. And 2008, with the end of the Bush administration and the beginning of Obama, is not a terribly significant event, at least in Sid's reading. And I wanted to hear more about that and why he doesn't see that as being a significant change. Um, there is a big debate about this in the legal literature, um, or at least in the blogosphere. And the terms that are usually used is um, the question of continuation, the continuation thesis. So is it true that Obama really has continued all of the worst excesses of the Bush administration, um, or was there some sort of significant change? Um, and people you know, often uh, you know, will point to surveillance. That's something that Sid talks about in the book. We live in a sort of surveillance state, which has not been diminished. Uh, but then the other examples that he gave, I mean, um, Sid talks about uh, Guantanamo Bay, and of course it was a huge um, uh, frustration on the part of the Obama administration that they've been unable to close Guantanamo. Um, but on the other hand, it's a little bit unclear uh, who is to be blamed for that. And on the one hand, although Guantanamo has not been closed, something that um, Sid doesn't really focus on in the book is that Obama has steadfastly refused to put anyone new into Guantanamo since he came into office. And so uh, the population there has been steadily declining. And even though he's been frustrated at every turn, he's refused to give up on this as a political goal of his to, to finally close Guantanamo Bay. He's still, he's still trying. And of the ones that remain at Guantanamo, Sid mentions that um, there are some who will not be released by the Obama administration, even though they can't be tried either before a military commission or a uh, civilian, I mean, a, a military commission or an Article III court. The real problem behind those detainees is that there's no place to send them because the country uh, from which they have came usually right, um, either the detainee himself does not want to go back there, um, and you can't just send someone back to a country that uh, might mistreat them because it's a violation of the uh, international rule on non rule month. You can't just send someone back to a country where they're going to be mistreated. And if the person doesn't voluntarily want to go to that country, um, it's, it's, it's a rights violation to send them back there. And then also the country has to be willing to accept them. So there's lots of countries you could say, well, why don't we send them there? It's because the country doesn't want them. Um, and so you've got this entire class of individuals um, who really are, um, you know, in a kind of stateless position. And I think that that creates a kind of ad hoc situation, some complexities that suggest that really we're living in a different era and we should think of this as you know, 2000 to 2008 and now there's a separate 
post-2008 situation. One last, you know, obvious example of this is the program of targeted killings, which is often used as the prime evidence for the continuation thesis that Obama not only um, uh, continued the drone program that Bush inaugurated, but he rapidly expanded it um, and started deploying it in, in uh, other theaters of war that, that Bush hadn't done. And um, Sid doesn't have a lot to say about this, but he does mention <clears throat> that there's irony here. He says, I think that's the word, he says it's ironic that um, instead of making more use of Guantanamo Bay, Obama radically increased the number of, of, of drone strikes. And Although I think there's a lot of contention surrounding the drone program, one thing that I would point to as being evidence for a discontinuation, right, a real fundamental change in the United States, is that <clears throat> starting in 2008, when Obama is elected, you get much greater precision to the administration's not just legal architecture, but also their political discussion of the war that we're fighting. So the years 2000 to 2008 were marked, especially in the first term of the Bush administration, 2000 2004, but it lingered also between 2004 and 2008, to a bunch of hysterical language regarding the global war on terror, which is a, a, a justly ridiculed term because there's no such thing as a war against terror, and there was also language of a war against radical Islam. Um, and a kind of sense that there was a clash of civilizations between the West and Islam. And the, the, the Bush administration was very much playing into that uh, political uh, discussion. But then starting in 2008 with Obama, you see a real precision to our discussion regarding the armed conflict paradigm. And that is um, Obama's not going to make any right, apologies at all for being incredibly aggressive in his use of military force. But he's going to say, we are engaged in an armed conflict with al-Qaeda. We're engaged in an armed conflict um, uh, with other non-state actors. And they've attacked us, or they're threatening to act, uh, attack us. And <clears throat> we're going to use military force to, to destroy them. Occasionally, some of those um, uh, legal arguments um, border on over-aggressive. And so in that sense, there's room for criticism. And I have certainly criticized a lot of them. But what I want to sort of articulate is, I think that there was a change there in 2008 where a lot of that older language was, was dispensed with and things became a lot more precise, and it, it showed a change in the political paradigm and the political program. And I'm just curious whether or not that's something that, that Sid would endorse or whether or not he disagrees with it. So in closing, I just want to say that I've learned so much from this book. I look forward to continuing the conversation with, uh, with Sid. And, like Joe, I also look forward to your next book. So thank you. Congratulations. <clears throat> Thanks so much to all of my so-called critics. They weren't really terribly critical, but I'll try and find something to re respond to. And before I do, let me say just a, a few words of thanks to um, my editor, Roger Hayden, who's here, and who, um, despite all the evidence in the publishing world, still thinks it's an editor's job to help an author write the best book he or she can. And I'm very grateful uh, to him. I'd also like to briefly thank my family, who are here, and uh, who have been a great source of support and patience during the six years that I've been working on this book. <clears throat> I've prepared some written remarks, some of them anticipating what I thought I would uh, learn, some of them perhaps not, not related to them, but related to my relationship to this building. And I call my remarks from a funeral to a law school. Well, that's a funny title, but I think it will become clear <clears throat> when you realize that the inspiration for this book began at a funeral, the funeral of my collaborator and mentor, Charles Tilley, in 2008, and was completed at the Cornell Law School. 
before Chuck passed away, I had the bad grace to complain to him that he left out of his book on war making and state building the subject he practically invented in other work, contentious politics. How would he respond? when he was charged with this sin of omission practically on his deathbed. I've written many books on both these subjects, he said, his tongue deeply embedded in his cheek. Why don't you bring them together? I took that as both a challenge and a fitting homage to the great social scientist to whom the book is devoted. But the book had more than a biological origin. In the social movement field, in which I've labored for over four decades, most of the research deals with what we can call politics in the street, what most people call social movements, eliding on the one hand the violent forms of contention we've been seeing around the world increasingly in the last two decades, and on the other, ignoring the more contained forms of contention that we see in the courtroom through legal mobilization. I didn't want to produce yet another book on social movements narrowly defined. I thought a lot could be gained by embedding movements in a broader framework that encompassed revolutions on the one hand and legal mobilization on the other. And this was what I meant by contentious politics. In War, States, and Contention, I looked at the relationship between social movements and the most contentious politics of all, war. In the book, I try to show that the advent of war is sometimes driven by social movements, that movements often affect the conduct of war, and that wars often trigger the production of movements in their wake. I also wanted to understand these relations in what was then called the global war on terror, mounted by the Bush administration in the wake of the bombings of September 11th, 2001. And that takes me to the third origin of the book contemporary politics in America. Observing the response of the Bush administration to the massacres of September 11th, I worry that we were in danger of abandoning the rights that Americans have enjoyed through two centuries of struggle. As they pursued the criminals who took thousands of lives on that day, Bush and his government seemed indifferent to the rights of Americans and hostile to those of foreigners. There was precedent, as Mike has pointed out, for hoping that this would end in a cycle of rolling back of the constraints of war and would lead to a restoration or even an increase in rights. But there were differences about this war as opposed to all other wars which were interstate wars, or at most, as in the case of the American Civil War, interregional wars. This was a war of a state against a transnational social movement, which didn't have a single venue, didn't operate on a simple battlefield method, but combined conventional and unconventional warfare and refused to follow the rules of war. So there was fear, justified fear at the time, that we would end up with an increase in despotic power and that this despotic power would continue through a kind of ratchet effect, it's the term that Posner and Vermeule use in their work in the early 2000s, and that the cycle that Jeff Stone writes about would be broken, that we would not return as we did after our past wars, 
to the protection of rights. True, the excesses of the Bush-Cheney regime had receded by the time I began this book. But under the liberal government of Barack Obama, and I guess this is in part a response to the continuous question, the American state was still abusing rights in the name of security and expanding surveillance to combat the threats we continued to face around the world. I wanted to understand whether the first decade of the 21st century would turn out to be a cycle of emergency rule like previous ones, or if it reflected, based on war against a new kind of enemy, a permanent decline in the American tradition of rule of law. As a social movement scholar who'd cut his teeth on European movements, communism, fascism, nationalism, I didn't know the first thing about how American rule of law operates in wartime. And that led me to draw on the work of a number of crit critic collaborators, each of whom <coughs> bears more responsibility for this book than they probably intended, and some of them in this room. Coming to the law school for a seminar one day in 2012, I met Mike Dorf, <coughs> and he casually asked if I'd be willing to fill in for Josh Chaffetz, who is here, and who would be on leave the next term in co-teaching the colloquium on the Constitution. <coughs> Luckily, a sympathetic dean, who's also here, was willing to let me under the corner of the law school tent. And for that, I'm sincerely grateful to Stuart Schwab. Teaching with Mike, I quickly learned <clears throat> that many scholars knew much more about the constitutional and legal issues surrounding war and rights than I did. And that helped me to decide that if I had a contribution to make, it would not be as a pseudo-lawyer, but as a comparativist who claimed to know something about contentious politics in the United States and Western Europe, and could use these comparisons to learn about our contemporary conundrum. That explains the unusual architecture of the book. Part one explores the relationships among war, states, and contention in three historical cases, revolutionary France, the United States, and Italy. In each of them, I found that movements intersected with the states in important ways that either helped to bring on the war, as the French Jacobins did in the 1790s, or helped to inspire a war with a liberating message, as the abolitionists did in the American Civil War, or seized the opportunity of a war to take power, as the Italian fascists did after World War I. In part two of the book, I turn to war, states, and contention in the United States after 1945, but especially since 9-11. The radically new phenomenon of the 21st century, I argued, is not that national movements episodically go to war against states, but that states wage war against transnational movements with profound implications for national security law and national security politics. I learned a lot about both of these by registering as an auditor, probably the oldest in the history of the law school, in Aziz Rana's course on national security law, as well as being a gifted scholar and a careful student of the law, Aziz who's not here because he's currently visiting a minor law school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, taught me that cases matter. Sometimes, decades after when they come down from the court, and often in ways that the justices never intended. And what brings about that shift and that development is politics. <clears throat> 
Law, I learned from Aziz, is not everything. And that was where my third critic collaborator came in, Joe Margulies, who was then at the Northwestern Law School and who was attorney of record in the path-breaking Supreme Court case of Russell v. Bush, and who came to Cornell to talk about his book, Guantanamo and the Abuse of Presidential Power. Joe's work posed the greatest challenge to what I was doing. For him, it was not simply that laws were broken by the Bush-Cheney administration. It was, as he demonstrated in his next book, what changed when everything changed, was that we don't abrogate the American creed when government breaks the law. We just adjust the meaning of the creed to match whatever it is we want to do. And this led me, although Joe will deny it, to one of the main claims of my book. Though he doesn't think I take it far enough, and he wants me to join Valerie in writing new books following from this, I developed the concept of infrastructural power to describe how the American state adapts its practices in wartime without exercising a great deal of coercion. In this, I differed from a host of critics, most notably from Giorgio Agamben and from Kim Shepley, both of whom worried that America after 9-11 was sinking into a swamp of what Michael Mann called despotic power. It was Mann's concept of infrastructural power that helped me to see that the genius of American politics is not ruling over civil society, but within it. Drawing on two other constitutional lawyers, David Cole and Jack Goldsmith, I saw another side to the Mannian coin. While the channels of infrastructural power permit the state to develop partnerships in civil society to advance its goals, those same channels allow civil society actors to influence state practices. In an ironic way, it was not the politics in the street of the anti-Iraq war movement, but it was a novel social movement actor, Edward Snowden, working as an infrastructural specialist, that was actually his title, an infrastructural specialist for a contractor with the American government who used those channels in order to challenge the American national security state. Assisted by a small group of activist journalists, it eventually brought about a frontal conflict between the government and a growing privacy movement that continues to contest the NSA today. As I finished the book, I became aware that while much of what I documented took place within the United States, much more was going on outside our borders. From right after 9-11, through resolutions of the UN Security Council and through cases filed with the Inter-American Human Rights Commission by the Center for Constitutional Rights, multinational inst international institutions were both prosecuting the war on terror and being used to rein it in. And here I was literally at sea. <clears throat> I'd come from comparative politics and I had cordially ignored international relations and international law. But here I was having to cope with the fact that the war on terror was becoming an international war on terror. That the American emergency state was blending and bleeding into an international state of emergency.
If it hadn't been for auditing the course of Muna and Dulu and getting the advice of my final critic collaborator, Jens, I don't think I could have written part three of the book on what I called the dark side of internationalism. So you can see why I call my response from a funeral to a law school. And to extend the metaphor, I hope that the book I've written here does not end up in the cemetery of unread books. Without the help and the encouragement of these friends and other friends at the Cornell Law School, I don't think I could have ever completed the book. So thanks to them and thanks to the law school.